What is up, everybody? And welcome back to our holiday cartridge talks. Now, if you listened to the last one we did on the Weatherby 65 RPM, you might notice at the very beginning, I opened it with a little light singing. So first off, I'd like to apologize for that. Now, you'll also notice if you listen to that one, and if you did listen to it, that just means you're really smart and you love the holidays as much as we do. Mm. You might have heard Jim close with a happy Christmas, which Jim, you said that's kind of a tip of the hat to? To the British. To the British, which brings me to my next point, the cartridge we're going to talk about today, a listener suggestion, the 303 British. That's right. We've got a variety of visual aids. We've got some cartridges themselves. But Jim, you, you brought something here too to, to show and tell. I know. I brought something that's very special to me. This is It's hard to talk about the 303 British without also talking about the Lee Enfield firearm that, uh, that, that fired it for many, 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 many years, which I'm sure we'll get into. Uh, this particular one is, is not you know one that maybe I would guess saw combat. It's, it's far too nice looking. But it's still a good representation. Where'd you get this thing, Jim? Uh, a bank parking lot. Okay. I was I'm not going to disclose which <laughs> bank and when. It was also connected to a mall, though, so it wasn't just a bank parking lot. I and actually, the guy was really nice. It's I, like I don't know if that's a step up from a Walmart parking lot. Have you ever seen no, the movie? No, it was a step up because the guy was the guy was not. He was wearing you know a track a suit. suit. No, okay, not so a track suit. It was like a you know, business suit. from. Uh, Is that better? <laughs> from a like a level of you know I guess classiness or whatever. Like yeah, I would say like a bank is a little bit more upscale, but it's also not. It was a bank. He was wearing a business suit. It's a nice classy collector. I'm just rifle. not saying that's where I'd be like pulling firearms out of my trunk. Is at the bank. I, we weren't parked like right up front. Anyway. <laughs> okay. Have you ever seen the movie Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels? No, that's a mouthful. Oh, man, you got to watch it. Okay. Many scenes reflect what you just described in Neat. that movie. Okay. Guy Ritchie should... film. It's British. Oh, good. Is it really? Yeah. Oh, this oh is, is it British? <laughs> this is fantastic That's news. my Arthur show. Well, now I have some homework. How about we talk about the 303 Brit? It's very old, right, Ryan? Uh, 1888, 1889. Now, you had mentioned something before we started. Yes. The year that it was retired from service from official accounts was the year 2020. My god. I mean that was that was one that I that I found in an article and it was it was basically some state police in uh, somewhere in India. 130 years of service. Had finally retired the Oli Enfields from their armory. 130 years. I mean 1891, right? Is that what you said, Ryan? 1889-1890. Okay. Yeah. To you got to think that the 303 Brit has probably seen the most conflict of any of any cartridge ever made. Maybe minus the 7.62 by 54R. That one's still humming. <sighs> yeah, so it it, it, it was may, 1891. Yeah, that one might have it beat, but it's up there. It's up there. Prolific. Well, Very much so. And maybe that speaks to a little bit. When I look at this cartridge, I don't look at that thing and go, "Oh man, that thing's old." Like it looks pretty no. damn modern. Looks more modern than a thirty thirty, and has obviously stood the test of time in some capacity. Right, uh, Ryan. What's going? It's got it's got some unique attributes to it. What's going on with this thing? It's a black powder cartridge that got turned into a not black powder cartridge that eventually got turned into a smokeless powder cartridge. Um, so it's that's that old. Predates the thirty thirty. Black powder to mm. cordite, cordite to smokeless powder. Yes, nitroglycerin. My, f- <laughs> my first introduction to cordite was splitting open a three hundred three British round. Yeah, yep. It's so weird. It comes out like uncooked spaghetti noodles. Yep. It smells terrible when you burn it. Well, it smells kind of good. Actually, it, do- it does smell yeah. oddly satisfying. We, but they uh, had all these. There was like they had Mark. I remember I was thinking it was like, oh yeah, Mark one, Mark two, Mark three. And then somewhere in the article it skipped, and all of a sudden I was at like Mark V I I I Z Z. Sorry, British people. You know, <laughs> it was just like they've they've had so many iterations of this cartridge over the years. It's it's pretty wild. Even they were even making it with cordite until like the '60s. It's cordite is a fascinating thing. Um, I'm glad they held on to the just timeless classic for as long as they did. Probably could have seen a little bit better performance out of it. Um, as Jim had mentioned earlier, very prolific military round. Its inception adoption uh, was for that. Uh, surprising sporting round, though. Um, from a ballistic standpoint, 
between a 3030 Winchester and a 300 Savage um, with modern loading. So 170, 180 grain bullet at 2,500 feet per second ish. Um, no slouch if you were going to hunt with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and certainly as a uh, an arm of war, that would be sufficient. How did it work when they had, so it, when they first started, I, I read that it was a 215 grain projectile round nose, but it was black powder. Now they had like a black powder charge in there. There was a wad, there was a flash hole. They'd be like, how does this, I, I see people load up a muzzle loader and I'm like, okay, it makes sense. It's old school, but it makes sense to me. But then when you com- you put it all into a cartridge and then you put the cartridge in the gun, so it's. It's got center fire, smokeless things that I'm used to, you know, modern stuff I'm used to, but then there's old stuff inside the modern stuff. It's kind of confusing. So black powder cartridges are actually an old thing. Um, oh. You'd have to get back into the 1840s, maybe even 1830s um, for black powder cartridges, not counting paper cartridges, um, but but a, a metallic cartridge, metallic case of some kind, be it copper, yeah. or brass, or whatever. Um, so within this, as we read, there would have been a... Uh, cylinder of black powder placed that would have had a through hole so if anybody listening to this has ever shot a triple seven pellet or a pirate x pellet out of your muzzle loader there's a through hole in that to allow the um, flash from the priming device or compound or mixture or whatever to go into the hole and ignite that powder as well as the outside of it and then above that was placed a over powder wad as it would be called and then the bullet itself um and that's that's actually pretty common from like a a metallic cartridge firing black powder. Standard. It reminds me of like a shotgun shell, but yeah. It, so if you back up, you a have little like bit, the wad in there and the, all that. It reminds me that yeah. So the predecessor to the Lee Enfield for military service for the British Empire and everywhere that its light touched would have been the Martini, which was an interesting drop breech single shot. That was chambered in a massive smattering of black powder cartridges uh, and then into center fire cartridges, or well, modern center fire cartridges. Um, generally, very large bore, um, you know, between 40 and 50, and, and sometimes even higher than that, like a 577. Um, up there, big, slow moving chunks of lead, Jeez. black powder charged, but it would have been constructed very much the same way. Um, so that was convention um, up, up until, well, not that long ago, yeah. early 1900s, mid 1900s. Um, that's what they did with the black powder. And, and they, when they came out with this thing, I, they probably looked at it like, "What's this teeny little bullet in here doing?" Because they went from a 45 down to a 303. And I think even at first they weren't very pleased with it. No, as as we read, there was some accounts of its failure to incapacitate when compared to the 450. Yeah, they had yeah. to change up the bullet design a little bit. Yep, and uh, has stayed remarkably unchanged since. I, I mean, I guess with the addition of smokeless powder to up that velocity a bit, but... Um, Quite a bit. Yeah. Because they went through, I think they start. what did they start out at like 1,800 feet per second? Yep. And Cordite helped them, helped them start to sniff that 2,000. Yeah. Breach that 2,000. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, next thing I knew, like I said, in, the, in some of the stuff that I was reading, it was like, and in the 1930s, we were up to 2,550. Yep. Feet per second. And it's like, whoa, okay. Yeah, that's the up there. Cordite is so unstable. <laughs> it's like dynamite. And um, it's maybe they end in ite, so that's why. But so unstable. And it's funny to me because a lot of these hung out in um, like jungle environments. Mm-hmm. And what a terrible place to have cordite. Um, God bless smokeless powder. Mm. <laughs> I mean, really. It really is delightful. Yeah. Yeah. The cordite, no, so it's unstable in that. It's susceptible to being compromised. Yeah, environmental contamination. Like not like if you fall down with a bunch in your pocket, you're like, ah, bang. I mean, it no, is mini I think, dynamite, uh, right? Yeah, I, I think that it was also unstable from like an impact standpoint too. It's kinda, mini dynamite. We'll look into this. Yeah. I God, I wonder if I still have some 303 Brit rounds at home that are loaded with cordite. That we was, had one sitting around here inside did. the office at one point. We probably actually should have disposed of that. It was just openly... Yeah, we we did that on out. open cordite. That was a military arms. Yeah, and we we did we cracked open a three hundred three Brit and we ex, ex, extracted some cordite. That was incredibly f- interesting. First and only time I've seen smell handled cordite. Yeah, yeah. I wonder what happened. It was interesting. Then. You should he, tune it. Hey, tune it here. Little plug for that podcast. That I was a good that, podcast. That was really interesting. Yeah, but this this was basically the this was the British thirty out six. 
you know, because we had the thirty out six, and we had our battle rifles that were chambered in that. Of course, we had the uh, we had the the Springfield, which is our bolt action rifle, yep. and then we we graduated on to the M1, your whatever Garand, Garand, however you want to say. It. We graduated on to that. We had semi automatics and things of that nature, and they kind of stuck it out uh, with the with the the bolt action rifle for a while till 2020 <laughs> uh, i think the british up- updated uh and and probably many other countries but um uh, they shot 303 out of all kinds of stuff it wasn't just this firearm they machine, had machine guns yep. and various items anti-aircraft aircraft mounted um they had them attached to tanks they figured a lot of ways to shoot 303 british yep. i mean bolt guns machine guns yep. short bolt guns the jungle carbine is still one of the, the coolest guns i think ever uh and yeah, they had the. Uh, didn't was this the gun that they had like a weird version where they like turned it into a a, a machine gun, but it was just the Liam. Or- no, I think you're thinking of the 1903 with the Peterson device. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, I don't believe there was a machine gun version for the Lee Enfield. Although you know, it wouldn't surprise me. It, w- it, it wouldn't. In Touch those times, in the World War times, yeah. people made anything out of anything, yeah. just because they had to. These things were made all over the world. Mm-hmm. You can find them where they were made in India. You can find them made in at the BSA factory, uh, Birmingham Small Arms, and uh, you can find them, I believe, somewhere made in the states, even uh, at times. And I think this one is from the, I believe this one's from Canada, if I recall correctly. This particular one is a is a Mark uh, a number four Mark One Long Branch, nineteen fifty. I think that Long Branch is uh, is in Canada. If I'm not and, mistaken. And carried by the Canadians for many, many years. The Mounties also yeah. used them for a while, yeah. yeah. But it has, a, it has a detachable box magazine that holds 10 rounds. Yep. The bolt is is very interesting. Cock like, on close. Yes. So it takes nothing, no no resistance whatsoever to you encounter when you... Give it a, give it a rip, Jim. Well, so right now, when the... Uh, so when the bolt is closed, and in this case, the the firing pin, if you will, is cocked... Uh, of course, we have it empty, all that good stuff. That's part of the reason I was distracted, because I'm like, well, some some safety police is probably going to be on here freaking out. But anyway, um, so being that this is cocked right now, if I just were to lift this up, you can see... Whew, oh, bam. Shot back. I didn't even do that, do that at all. But then you encounter kind of the resistance as you're going forward, but it's, it's a little bit weird if you're used to the, the rifles like we have now that cock on open... But when you get used to it, I mean, they did the. Uh, th- this was this is well known for the old Mad Minute. It had a more official British military designation for the drill. But they would shoot. Uh, their trained marksmen. One of many tests that they would be uh, tested on was the Mad Minute, and they would shoot fifteen rounds at a target that was four feet square at three hundred. I believe I read yards, maybe as meters. Very, you know, either way. Um, and they had to do that in under a minute. Started with one in the chamber and four in the magazine, and then they had to load five at a time when they got to that point. Via clip. Via a clip, yes. So it can be loaded with a clip or the super cool... They hadn't fully... They didn't really... Uh, this was back like when we came out with red dots and people weren't fully like trusting of it. You know, They were like, ah, I don't know. I still want an iron. There, They're like, well, we have this really great detachable box magazine, but I still want to load it with a clip just in case. <laughs> um but yeah, that's what they did. They would, uh, they would, they would run the bolt with their palm. They wouldn't run it like with their thumb and forefinger. They would run it with their palm to be faster. But it's, I okay. just love the ergonomics on these things. It's just they had it figured out so long ago. The bolt is right there next to the trigger. It's just you can run it so quick. It's pretty neat. It is pretty sweet. Apparently, they weren't as accurate as 1903s. No, which is why I've never been that attracted to them. Yeah, you know it's cool though. Speaking of Enfields, up until like the early to mid two thousands, there was an outfit that rechambered these to forty five seventy. Why would you do that? I was going to ask the same question. That's a cool. That's cool, man. Why is that but, cool? Yeah, though? I don't understand Aren't you where that history. Really, for, what did you do that for? Forty five seventy bolt gun. My good buddy Anderson, if he's is listening, it that, that that doesn't that doesn't exist elsewhere. Nope. But also, what, really. What would be a person's, I guess, you know, reason to be like, oh, man, you know what would make this thing better? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a great question. What do you need? Do you need a particularly strong receiver in order to do that? Or so? is that what this offers? Yeah, or you did know, they just, case, somebody just felt like it? Case heads aren't that far apart in size, and they fit. It's clever. 
It's a lot neat. of things fit. Yeah. Doesn't well, mean you I mean, I'm not attacking. Don't shoot the messenger. I know. I'm just letting you know that well, you use the it's platform. Not that it's just that you're the messenger. It's that you. It sounds like you have a a, a distinct position in this. Yes. At first, like it seemed like cool. you were an advocate of this. If I was going to have an Enfield, I probably would. I'd like one of these things that was highly rated, many stars on it. Or I'd rather. What do you mean, many stars? They, Mine they only rank, has they one rank star. them in stars. Mine only has one. So when star. you had a real, when you had a real sharpshooter, they put more stars on it. No kidding. Huh? Yeah. Mm. So the stars were. I didn't know if that was like condition or you know. So it was well, like, kind of. Yeah. Well, you can't have mine because you just bastardize it. Well, I'm sorry, Jim. Um, I'd rather have a 4570. That's cool. How many 4570s do you have? Two. <laughs> that the government knows about? <laughs> Question mark. <laughs> I have a 4570. Um, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's an endearing military cartridge. I like the sporting. Three Brit. I like yes. Yes, mm. I like the sporting history of the cartridge more. Um, Be a fantastic deer gun. It would. And and it um, is for many people. It did a lot of work in Africa and India hunting. Mm-hmm. A lot. Um, if you read some Capstick, you read some of the series where he talks about the um, leopard hunters and, and uh, ivory hunters and lion hunters of yore. 303 was a popular, a popular pickup. Um, because of just availability, availability. is what people had. Probably, yeah. Right? So mm. for for somebody back in that day to own a you know fancy double rifle, um, that person would have to be quite stately. And many of these ivory hunters were either on the run from the law, or uh, maybe they had fallen out of social graces and were looking to get to the new dark continent and and do some do some hunting and some adventuring. And the three hundred three Brit in sure. Enfield was easy to come by. A lot of elephants killed by this cartridge. A lot of lions, tigers, possibly some bears. I feel like I read a book. This was a while back, but it was. Uh, I feel like the three hundred three was like, in it was basically this guy was, in some ways like a professional slash contracted to kill all these like uh, man eating cats. Are you thinking of the lions of Tsavo that no, terrorized the? I, I think it was called the Leopard so, of Rudra Priya. No, don't quote me. If you've read this, he's book just going to keep throwing and, stories at you. No, you. if you've read this book and this <laughs> cartridge was not even part of it. Oh, well, then I'm ca- it, it's, it's quite possible, but it was the Black Panther of Penangali, I think. So that would have been in. Yeah, that would make sense. I'm gonna have to. I still own that book. I'm gonna see if this cartridge actually did appear mentioned in it. Mm. I could be misremembering. Was it Jim Corbett? I can't remember the author. Like I said, Mark, no, the, he's the, he's only a, he's going to just keep throwing yeah, I don't names know. at you. I don't know. Like I don't know the answer. I'll know tomorrow. I'll bring the book in. Was the gentleman's name Lee? All right. I um, I don't do that, but I appreciate you. We talked about the um kind of the you know the case. It appeared in you know obviously bolt guns, machine guns. I think from what I understand, what people liked about it is that it fed very reliably. Very. Let's talk about the case. Sure. Yeah. So, did the rim like the help measurements, with that? the numbers, the the um, rim, the bot? Like it's no, not not from the machine gun standpoint. I probably. wouldn't think so. No. Um, I mean, you could get some. Did uh, it work against it? Do you think? I don't think so. It's been a long time since I've got to touch a Vickers machine gun, and I'm really not intimate with how their their feed shoot works. I don't think it would necessarily hinder it. No, I could see where extraction could be further facilitated with a rimmed case. Um, yeah, I don't think it would hurt. I guess it. the bottom line, it was noted for feeding reliably. Yeah, so it's if you platforms. if you look at the the case, like it has a defined taper, right? Mm-hmm. So okay. from from head to shoulder. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, cases with that, you know, similar taper are often renowned for their feeding reliability. Okay, yeah. sure. Which makes sense. It's like I mean, almost its, its own ramp. Yeah. Literally, like a like a tapered collet in a machine. You know, like you mm-hmm. just it just. Yep, as opposed to like a think of a very square case, like a twenty five Winchester super short mag. The square something is, the harder it is to put into the round hole quickly. So yeah, I mean renowned for feeding and reliability. Um and then used, as Mark said, in small arms like the Lee Enfield, Vickers machine guns, aircraft mounted machine guns, anti aircraft machine guns, um, all manner of things that uh the British used and, and their their allies. Um yes. Like I said, man, is there thirty out six? Yeah. We found a lot of ways to shoot thirty out six in the wars. They found a lot of ways to shoot three oh three Brit. Mm-hmm. We both still have them around, and people enjoy them to this very day. Um, 
you said that you think of when you th- think 303 Brit, mm. you don't even think about the conflict, the, the battle history that it has. No. Well, okay. Two things come to mind. One, the first thing that comes to mind is some gentleman in early 20th century Africa wearing um, way too short of shorts, wool socks, boots. Like a gym coach. Yes. But, uh, but they're, they're a khaki mm. short. And he's got a big knife and he's got a cartridge loop holder on his belt um, full of 303 Brit and he's got a crusty old very dark brown stock 303 mm-hmm. it's um, the guy from Jurassic Park whose name escapes me yeah yeah and he's got he's got the hat that's that's safari hat um, and then I also think of um, I saw a pretty in- invoking picture one time of a uh, an Indian continent tribal leader and I don't know from what part of the Indian continent he was from and he had a contraband piece that was probably as old as um, spoken language. I mean, it was old and it was heavily decorated um, in like traditional Indian decorations, florals, painted, brass tacks pounded into it, um, bits of ribbon and, and um, lace and things tied onto it and it was being confiscated by the police. It was one, it was a, it was an infield. It was an infield. Yeah. And, it was probably a ceremonial arm more than anything, mm. uh, but firearms ownership over there is a no, no. A lot sure. of flair on that thing. Sounds yes, like yeah, heavily embellished. Oh, that's, that's style. But uh, yeah, Lee, it's one of those ones where if if the gun turned up in just about any continent, any country, somewhere in the world, people would be like, oh yeah, one of those. Mm-hmm. Familiar. Mm-hmm. Maybe even got one in the back somewhere. Yeah, well, that that old thing. <laughs> this old thing. Uh, do you think? That that's what the British think of the thirty out six. I'd like to know. They're like, oh yeah, we don't even think about. I mean, the three hundred three. That's what that's what won wars. We don't even think about the thirty out six. They're like, yeah, that thing. I was used by old Teddy Roosevelt, right? You guys shoot, I'm, shoot animals with that. Yes. I'm, I'm going to speculate here. Jim. You guys shoot animals with that. I'm going right? to speculate, but if I was running a bolt gun, and I looked over, and some dude was running an auto loader or not six, I'd be like, I want that. <laughs> But what the bolt design on this thing, Mark? You can shoot it so fast. Oh, yeah. I don't think you're going to shoot it faster than an auto. <laughs> you might, yeah, I think you might. Of course, you, you know the guy with something. the guy with the auto. And again, speculation. And, and uh, this is not. Um, thank God for the greatest generation. I guess I'll just say that. Sure. Uh, I'm not. But he might have been like, I'm out of ammo. And he might be I shot it all up. <laughs> jealous of the guy that was maybe just running things a little bit slower. I don't know. No idea. You would have had a harder time with the uh, Garand doing that thing from uh, what was that? Now, granted, this was the Germans doing this in that one movie, but they all had the clickers to communicate. And the German guy comes over and he's going, he's like running his bolt on his Mauser oh, no to try and. Uh, <clears throat> I didn't see you that. Movie. You know what movie I'm talking about? No. These paratroopers land somewhere in France, I believe, and they're mm-hmm. using clickers to communicate with one another instead of obviously like yelling yep. at each other. And but then the Germans catch on to it, and they're using their bolt actions, just going, and they're using that to to not fool them. Those little clickers are neat. They are super cool. Yeah, that and Liberator pistols. Not familiar. Well, wait a minute. I'd have S- to sprinkled about the French countryside. Oh yeah. Yep. They were more difficult to reload than they were to change a gun. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Actually, stamp oh steel, tossed about. That doesn't sound practical. French resistance against the Nazi incursion. I love that. Yeah, and then paratroopers and clickers. Clickers are neat. They are neat. Ryan, I'm, can I? I want to talk about a lot of things. We have, and I'm I'm, I'm kind of backtracking here, but I want to talk about the case a little bit more. So it's 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 a it's a bottlenecked rimmed cartridge. Yes. It's the 303 Brit. Yep. What does the 303 denote? Oh, that's a great question. So it's 30 caliber, but it's not our 30 caliber. No, it ain't. And it's not the Russians 30 caliber either. It's another 30 caliber. And it's um, pretty unique until unto itself. Um, only a handful of other cartouches would have had that okay. that I'm aware of. Um, the rim, as we talked about earlier, facilitates chambering headspace um, in like a single shot, but has been adapted well to this. And I wonder if this is a vestigial trait from the Martini, because the Martini is a single shot. Okay. And I 
do in fact, I'm going to have to check on that, wonder if that is a vestigial trait. Because there would have mm. been no real reason to have a fully rimmed cartridge in a bolt-action repeater. Oftentimes, people just can't let go of the past when they're making new things. Yeah. Um, it's but, hard. It's what you have to go off of, too, it is. though. It is. You know? like it's. It could not even be a matter of letting go. It's just the natural evolution. That's fair. But... As Mark had mentioned earlier, it's a very modern bottleneck case for as old as it is. If you look at a 3030, it looks completely antiquated in comparison. Short neck, regular shoulder, a little bit more taper to the case body. Then the rim is a little bit out of place in, in the modern design. But um, 303, proprietary bullet diameter um, for this this rifle. So don't um, don't confuse that with point three oh eight or point no. 311.12. Yep. I want to read you what I have here. Please yep. Let me know if you concur. The measurement 0.303 inch, 7.70 millimeters, mm-hmm. is the nominal size of the bore measured between the lands, which follows the older black powder nomenclature. Mm-hmm. And then the rim, Ryan. Yeah. What what function is it performing on this particular cartridge? Well, here again, that that would depend on which arm it's being fired out of. Okay. Yeah. Um, so let's, say, let's okay, take so, the, the infield. So Jim had mentioned earlier the clips that were used. So when we say clip, we're not talking about magazine. There's a distinction here. This is a magazine. We don't have a clip here. Um, but that clip would have held five rounds, and this rim would have slid into that. And then on the top of the rifle, we can see there's the clip guide or a stripper clip guide, if you want to call it that, which is right there. Okay, so you take the clip, you put it in, okay, right. and you'd push it down with your thumb. The clip would then discard, and your magazine would be half-loaded. So that helps feeding in the clip. Okay. Um, and then can control headspace and can assist in extraction. So we look at, like, uh, 4570 or 444 Marlin, another rimmed cartridge. Um, headspace and extraction. That makes sense to me. Good stuff. Yes. Trying to think if I have any other questions that might come up via my, well, my printouts, was, Jim. I know. You got the printouts. This one was requested by some listeners out there, so hopefully we have met their uh, hopefully we met their expectation. We did talk about, like I said, we talked about a bunch here. Uh, but, you know, how do you not talk about a bunch? There's a, a lot cartridge going has on been here. around for over 100 and some odd years. It's been part of everything. You, you are correct in that you really can't have this cartridge talk without that rifle. Yeah. It's not even a notable mention. It's a significant component. It is. Peanut butter and jelly. It is. Very true. Yeah. I like it. (sighs) I like it too. Well, thanks, guys. Thank you, Ryan, for For all the information. Jim, all the information, bringing your rifle in. Thanks to Bill for having some 303 Brit on hand. Just happy to to go, Bill. Just like, oh, oh, these old things. Yeah, it was like, it was uh, serendipitous, as I like to say. Yes. Uh, And uh, thanks, uh, everybody, for listening. Yeah. Thanks, British people. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to know. I'd like to hear from Chris at CSW if he thinks about what he thinks about when he thinks about thirty out six. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, we'll just have to ask. He'll hear it. All right. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. See we'll ya. catch you on the next one. Bye. Bye.